Okay. So let me recall orthogonal and uh, unitary matrices. Uh, first, I will introduce these groups, uh, which are called classical groups. Uh, many of you uh, must have done a course on group theory, uh, where you were exposed a little bit about these groups. Uh, these are very important mathematical objects. Uh, let me just recall these. So the first is the set GLNF of uh, called the general linear group. Okay. This is the general linear group of n by n invertible matrices where entries are can be from any field. So you can think of field of real numbers or complex numbers, but uh, there is a very interesting body of literature when F is a finite field. And uh, so this is called the general linear group. The special linear group uh, consists of matrices in uh, GLNF, which have determinant one. And this is a normal subgroup of GLNF. Uh, similarly, <clears throat> so uh, the vector space Rn, uh, we know it is equipped with the standard inner product of vectors, which is the dot product. And in terms of matrices, I can write the dot product as U transpose V. We think of vectors as column vectors. Then U transpose V, is the uh, dot product of these two vectors. And similarly, the vector space Cn, the n-dimensional complex vector space, that is equipped with the standard inner product, which is uh, similar to the usual dot product of real vectors. And this is the u star v. So that's a complex number. Uh, if uh, I have an invertible matrix, uh, uh, invertible matrix, and suppose that uh, I want the uh, dot product to be preserved. That means the dot product of U and V is same as the dot product of AU and AV. Uh, then this, this condition I can write in this way, uh, U transpose V is equal to AU transpose AV. And that is U transpose A transpose V. So for every pair of vectors U and V, the dot product of U and V is same as dot product of AU and AV. Uh, so if I specialize now, by taking u and v to be the jth standard basis vector, then it says that a e j transpose a e j is equal to one. And this really means that the jth column vector of a is a unit vector, right? Because this is the dot product of a e j is the jth column vector of a. So every column vector is a unit vector. Uh, and then if I take uh, two uh, vectors e j and e k where j is not equal to k, then this condition that u transpose v is equal to the uh, dot product of au and av, uh, this translates into this condition that uh, ej transpose a transpose a e k is equal to zero. Uh, and uh, this, this says that the column vectors of a are mutually perpendicular unit vectors. And uh, when column vectors are mutually perpendicular unit vectors, we say that the n column vectors form a orthonormal basis of uh, Rn, but that condition can be uh, written as A transpose A is equal to A transpose equal to identity. So, so, so if we want uh, matrix multiplication to preserve the dot product of vectors in Rn, then this matrix has to satisfy this condition that A transpose A is A transpose equal to identity. And uh, similarly, so such uh, real square matrices are called orthogonal. Uh, that means these are the matrices which satisfy this condition. Now this condition, we, we took uh, real field, but this condition makes sense over any field that A transpose A is equal to identity. So such matrices are called orthogonal matrices when the entries are real. And similarly, a complex square matrix is called unitary if A star A is equal to A star equal to identity. And you can check that uh, this is precisely the condition for uh, preservation of the uh, Hermitian inner product, standard Hermitian inner product on Cn, that the transformation uh, U mapping to AU preserves the standard uh, inner product on Cn if and only if the matrix is a unitary matrix. Now you uh, look at all the uh, matrices which are orthogonal of fixed size n by n, then uh, the condition that A transpose A equal to A transpose equal to identity uh, implies that product of two orthogonal matrices is orthogonal and inverse of an orthogonal matrix is also orthogonal. So the orthogonal matrices of n by n size, they form a group and that is called the orthogonal group. 
inside this group we have this uh, subgroup called son which is all matrices uh, orthogonal matrices which have determinant one and uh, they are of size n by n so this is called the special orthogonal group and this is the principal focus in my lecture especially so3 right 3 by 3 orthogonal matrices of determinant one so they form this group and we want to understand what is the geometry uh, of uh, these matrices and what do they physically represent they, they act on rn so on rn we want to understand what is the geometric interpretation of the x of uh, action of these matrices on r3 so similarly the, the unitary matrices by this definition a star a equal to a star equal to identity implies that the unitary matrices also form a group that is called the unitary group and inside the unitary group we have the special unitary group a belonging to un so determinant a is one and that is the special unitary groups these these groups have very rich mathematical structures they can be realized as uh, manifolds or algebraic varieties and um, uh, there is very rich representation theory of these groups and they are active area of research uh, which has uh, consequences in uh, all areas of mathematics if uh, <clears throat> all right so uh, but this is a small exercise for you that uh, the, the uh, matrix multiplication which preserves inner product, usual inner product, is uh, uh, the, the, these, this is given by orthogonal matrices precisely and the standard inner product on CN is preserved by precisely the unitary matrices. Okay. So uh, these, these matrices give rise to isomorphisms from Rn to Rn or CN to CN and these isomorphisms, they preserve the uh, inner product, which means they preserve the geometry in Rn. So if you have a figure in Rn, uh, plane figure or a solid figure, uh, when you apply this transformation induced by orthogonal matrix or unitary matrix, then you will get a conjugate, a figure which is, uh, which is exactly like the earlier figure. Uh, so this we know that physically this is possible by rotations and reflections and we want to reconcile this um, intuition of rotation reflections with the action of these matrices. Okay. So uh, as a concrete example of orthogonal matrix, let me introduce this uh, very famous matrix called the householder matrix, which is used uh, in uh, numerical computations uh, very extensively. Okay. So first, uh, a subspace of Rn, a subspace of Rn which has dimension n minus 1 is called a hyperplane. So if n equal to 3, it is really the, a plane passing through origin and there is a perpendicular direction to that plane. Uh, a linear map from Rn to Rn is called reflection with respect to a hyperplane if the action of T on this um, a vector which is perpendicular to H is is that tu is minus u and if you apply this transformation on vectors inside this hyperplane then it is identity so vectors inside the hyperplane are mapped to themselves and a vector which is perpendicular to the hyperplane is mapped to minus u and this is what happens when we reflect vectors with respect to a plane in r3 so imagine imagine a plane in r3 in r3 and a vector which is perpendicular to this plane. Uh, then reflection will map this vector to its minus u and vectors inside uh, h, they are mapped to themselves. So therefore, if you, uh, if you combine these action on vectors on h and ve on the vector u, then I get a linear transformation because linear transformation is determined by its action on basis vectors. If I take a basis of this hyperplane, which is n minus one dimensional, and uh, I add, add a vector u to this, that basis, then I have defined the action of t on these basis vectors. And uh, uh, so that determines the linear transformation. So this linear transformation from Rn to Rn is having uh, an eigenspace, which is uh, corresponding to eigenvalue 1, because all these vectors u, so that t u equal to u and u is not equal to 0, these are eigenvectors with eigenvalue 1. And uh, this vector u, which is a, which is a uh, unit vector perpendicular to h, this is, this is an eigenvector with eigenvalue minus 1. 
So think of these transformations where there are two eigenspaces, one eigenspace corresponding to eigenvalue one and another eigenspace corresponding to eigenvalue minus one. And one can show that if this E1 is n minus one dimensional and uh, E minus one is one dimensional, then it is, the, it is going to be a reflection uh, with respect to the uh, hyperplane, uh, which is the eigenspace of the uh, eigenvalue one. So one can characterize reflections in both these ways, either um, you know, referring to eigenvalues or, uh, or referring to the action on vectors in a hyperplane and vectors which are perpendicular. Okay, so we want to understand what is the matrix of this uh, reflection with respect to a hyperplane. And this is, uh, this is a very neat formula. So suppose I have a non-zero vector in Rn, and then we define householder matrix associated to this non-zero vector u to be the matrix which is identity minus two times u u transpose u u transpose in an n by n matrix of rank one. Yeah, u u is a non-zero vector, and then divide by the square of the length of u. This is the square of length of u. Okay, so uh, this is this is my matrix H u. Let us see what is the action. So if I operate at you on u, it is identity operating on u minus two u u transpose operating on u, but u transpose u is, is one. So this is u minus two u, which is minus u. So u is mapped to minus u. And if I take a vector w, which is perpendicular to u, so this, this vector u is, is mapped to minus u. And I take the vectors which are perpendicular to u, which are in this plane and uh, operate h u on w. So h u w is equal to w minus two times u u transpose w over u transpose u, but w is perpendicular to u. So u transpose w is zero and therefore it is just w. So the action of h u on uh, all the vectors in the hyperplane, which is perpendicular to u is that of identity and u ma is mapped to minus u. So this is, this is, uh, this is the action of HU and this matrix HU is called the householder matrix. Okay. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah, there is some issue about, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the householder matrix HU, let us see that it is a orthogonal matrix. So this is a small computation. To show that H U is orthogonal matrix, uh, I write H U as H and calculate S transpose H. So S transpose H is the product of these two matrices and you just multiply them uh, and it becomes identity. And similarly, H S transpose is also identity. And that is the condition for a matrix to be orthogonal. Uh, so S transpose H equal, to H equal to identity says that the column vectors of H form a orthonormal basis of Rn. Uh, let us apply this. Uh, this is uh, a situation in Rn, but let us specialize this to the plane. So in the plane, what is a reflection? Suppose I have xy plane, uh, then uh, take, take a line which is passing through the origin. Yeah. And I can apply reflection with respect to this line, which is passing through the origin. And uh, so suppose that the equation of this line is y equal to x times tangent theta. So, so this angle, this angle is theta. Okay. And to, so in order to, in order to find the householder matrix, which represents the reflection with respect to this line, uh, I have to take a vector which is perpendicular. Yeah. So if I take a vector which is perpendicular uh, here, this vector, then this vector is given by this. This is minus sine theta cos theta. This is perpendicular to this line. And now uh, we can construct the householder matrix with respect to uh, u. So uh, the formula was that the householder matrix with respect to u is i minus two u u transpose over u transpose u. So if you substitute u equal to this in this formula, then this is the matrix, yeah? So the angle is double. So this is the matrix of reflection with respect to the line, which is inclined at an angle theta from the x-axis. 
and you can check that the column vectors are uh, unit vectors and they are perpendicular. And another thing that you notice is that the determinant is minus one. Determinant of HU is minus one. And this is this is clear because householder matrix has two eigenvalues. One is minus one and uh, the there are n minus one eigenvalues which are equal to one. So determinant turned out to be minus one. But uh, the uh, orthogonal matrix of determinant one you can check very easily. They, they look like this. Yeah, cos theta sin theta minus sin theta cos theta because the, the uh, a two by two orthogonal matrix must have column vectors which are unit vectors and uh, they are perpendicular. So I can write a unit vector in this way because of the trigonometric identity cos square theta plus sin square theta is one. And a vector which is perpendicular to this vector is either of this form or this form sin theta uh, and minus cos theta. So, uh, so uh, th this distinguishes between orthogonal matrices by uh, their uh, eigen by their determinant. So, if determinant is minus one, it will look like this matrix. If determinant is one, then it is a matrix of rotation. Yeah, you can check that this matrix when it is acting on vectors rotates vectors in the anti-clockwise direction by an angle theta. Okay, so uh, so so therefore. We have understood what the elements of SO2 are. Yeah, so these are orthogonal matrices of determinant one, and uh, they represents rotations of the plane. And uh, and if I take a orthogonal matrix which is in O2 but it is not in SO2, then it is going to represent a reflection with respect to some line. So uh, orthogonal uh, orthogonal group of uh, order two has this uh, you know, geometric interpretations. And uh, we would like to understand uh, what is the geometry of orthogonal matrices of size three by three okay, or n by n. All right, so now let's move on to orthogonal transformations of Rn. Uh, I defined orthogonal matrices, but it really helps to uh, find a analog for uh, linear transformations. Uh, because the, the linear concept about linear transformation is going to be coordinate free and uh, one for the sake of proofs, one should deal with concepts which are coordinate free. Uh, so here is the definition, let V be a vector space with inner product. So V could be real vector space or complex vector space. A linear operator uh, is called orthogonal uh, from V to B if it is preserving length of vectors. Yeah, length of TU should be length of U. Okay, so I started by saying that uh, orthogonal matrices arise if we if we put the condition that they should preserve the inner product. But this condition that they preserve length is equivalent to the condition that uh, inner product is also preserving. So one can characterize orthogonal transformation in many different ways. So here are the, is this you must have studied in your linear algebra course. Let V be a finite dimensional linear product space and T be a linear operator. Uh, then the following uh, conditions are equivalent. Uh, so first condition is T is orthogonal transformation, which means it is preserving length of vectors. Yeah. So one thing that you can conclude from this, that if, if length is preserved, of course, U uh, is mapped to TU and TU is not going to be zero. So uh, T has to be necessarily uh, uh, invertible map if it is length preserving, but uh, uh, it is much more than uh, length uh, invertible map. So uh, this uh, the length preservation implies that it is also going to preserve the inner product of vectors. And uh, another way to test whether a transformation is orthogonal is to see that any ortho orthonormal basis of V is mapped to an orthonormal basis. Okay, so if if uh, if uh, inner product is preserved, then uh, then angles are also preserved because angles are defined uh, using the inner product. So if angles are preserved and length are preserved, then it is clear that the orthonormal basis is also mapped to orthonormal basis, and this is also a characterization. Then another way to test whether a transformation is orthogonal by, is by writing the matrix of T with respect to any orthogonal basis. And then it is going to be an orthogonal matrix. So that is the connection of orthogonal matrices 
and orthogonal transformations. So they are really one and the same. So orthogonal matrices give rise to orthogonal transformations. And uh, if you have an orthogonal transformation, then by fixing an orthogonal basis, uh, I can compute its matrix and that matrix will turn out to be orthogonal matrix. Okay, so if there are any questions I can answer, otherwise I can proceed. All right, so now let me come to the main theorem of uh, this lecture. And uh, this, uh, this, this, this is a theorem of Elie Cartan and uh, Jean Dieudonné. Uh, both were giants of 20th century. They worked in multiple areas. Uh, they are both French mathematicians. Uh, Elie Cartan, in fact, is one of the pioneers of uh, the representation theory of Lie algebras and uh, Lie groups. And uh, he successfully uh, merged the uh, old subject of differential geometry. Uh, with with these uh, Lie groups and Lie algebras. And uh, Diodone uh, thought about uh, these uh, classical groups or arbitrary field. So the theorem that I'm going to talk about was discovered by uh, Elie Cartan for the real and complex field. And it was generalized by Diodone or arbitrary field. So it is a very attractive statement. Let us see that. So uh, is, first of all, recall that uh, I call a hyperplane to be a subspace of Rn having dimension n minus one. And a linear operator from Rn to Rn, uh, recall that it is a reflection if, uh, if uh, vectors in a hyperplane are fixed and vectors which are perpendicular to hyperplane, which are, they are mapped to their negatives. So that is our definition of when a linear operator is a reflection. And then we have the notion of, uh, so then we saw that, uh, the householder matrix is a reflection with respect to the plane, which is perpendicular to U. And here is a, the statement of cartan diodonne theorem that every orthogonal transformation of a real inner product space of dimension N is a product of at most N reflections. With a slight variation, one can state such a theorem for complex uh, field also with some little bit of variation, but for the real field, it is a very neat statement that uh, uh, orthogonal group is generated by reflections. Yeah, so this is the content of this that uh, uh, the the householder matrices uh, they generate all orthogonal matrices. So for the matrix, it says that any orthogonal n by n matrix is a product of at most n householder matrices. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I will prove this theorem uh, by using induction on the dimension. And let me point out that uh, we, we, uh, uh, we translated the notion of orthogonal matrix into orthogonal transformation uh, exactly to uh, apply induction. Because once you state a problem about matrices, n by n matrices, it is sort of difficult to you know pass to go down to matrices of smaller size, which preserve the same properties. Uh, but here, uh, by translating the concept of orthogonal uh, matrices into orthogonal transformation, we can apply induction on the dimension, because for for the 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 concept of orthogonal transformation is, is uh, saying that the length of the vectors is preserved, okay? And uh, so keep that in mind. So apply induction on the dimension. Suppose I have uh, the vector space of dimension one. That means it is linear span of a single vector. V is linear span of single vector U. And uh, I can assume that this U is a unit vector uh, by replacing it by its length, U over length of U. Then uh, T u, because u t preserves the length of the vector, T u has no choice but to be mapped to either plus u and minus u. So if, if T u is equal to u, then it is identity. And if T u equal to minus u, it is a reflection. It's a, it's a one dimensional space. So if this is my vector u, then uh, T is going to map it to minus u. So therefore, uh, the theorem is a trivial statement uh, for one dimensional vector space. And uh, I'll urge you to prove it in dimension two yourself. And by, by knowing the structure of orthogonal matrices in dimension two, you can easily show this theorem by hand. 
uh, but uh, we are applying induction, so it is all right to begin with dimension one. So now we can assume that n is uh, at least two. That is, we are dealing with a real unit product space of dimension at least two, and assume that the theorem holds true for uh, orthogonal matrices of dimension uh, or acting orthogonal transformations acting on n minus one dimensional real unit product spaces. Okay, so that's the induction hypothesis that uh, if I have an orthogonal transformation of a vector space of dimension uh, n minus one, then it's a, it's a product of at most n minus one uh, reflections in hyperplanes. Okay, all right. So now we divide the proof into two cases. Uh, so we are trying to, uh, trying to decompose our orthogonal transformation as product of reflections. Now we know that uh, a reflection has lots of eigenvectors with eigenvalue one, uh, but uh, but that is not the case with rotations. Yeah, rotations have, uh, I mean, rotations are uh, transformations of uh, real vector space, uh, but but uh, they they are they are not having. I mean, uh, if you take rotation in dimension three, then there is an axis of rotation, so I do have a eigenvector with eigenvalue one. But if you take rotations of the plane. There is no eigenvalue uh, one for rotation of the plane. Okay, so we divide this into two cases. Uh, first, assume that there is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. This is certainly a possibility in many situations. So suppose Tx is x for some in non-zero x. So I have an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. Then I'll prove the theorem. Okay, so take a x which is uh, which is eigenvector uh, with eigenvalue one and take its perpendicular space. So action of T, so this, this vector X is fixed under the action of T and T is the orthogonal transformation. So now, now I take a subspace which is perpendicular to X. W is all vectors which are perpendicular to X. So that, that is an N minus one dimensional subspace. Because you have learned in your linear algebra course, that W uh, direct sum W per is equal to the whole space. Okay, so uh, this I start with a one dimensional subspace, then its perpendicular space will be n minus one dimensional, so it's a hyperplane. So this is, I I'm taking this vector x, which is uh, which is a eigenvector with eigenvalue one, and then I construct the hyperplane, which is perpendicular to x. Okay, now let us look at the action of T on the hyperplane. I know the action of T on X. So in order to understand T, we have to see what is its action on the hyperplane vectors in the hyperplane. So take a vector V is in, which is in the hyperplane, but then U is perpendicular to X and take the inner product of TU with X, that is TU TX because X is TX by my assumption, X is TX. But T is orthogonal transformation, okay? This is orthogonal. So TU TX inner product is same as inner product of U and X, but u is perpendicular to x, so this is equal to zero. So that means that T u is also perpendicular to x. <clears throat> okay, so that means T u is also in w. Okay, so T u is also in w. Okay, so I have this big vector space. Inside this, I have this uh, subspace of dimension n minus one, and T was my linear transformation, which was orthogonal. And what we have observed now is that uh, T is mapping W into W. And uh, this, this T was orthogonal. So when I restrict T to W, certainly it is orthogonal because being orthogonal is the property that uh, the length of vectors are preserved under the action of T. So same property holds for T. So this T is orthogonal linear transformation, but this W has dimension N minus one. Dimension of W is N minus one. So the theorem is true uh, for in, in this situation. So we just apply the uh, induction hypothesis and then see that um, that T from W to W is orthogonal transformation. And therefore by induction hypothesis, there are N minus one reflections of this uh, hyperplane so that T is the product of these reflections. Yeah, so there are R reflections of the hyperplane W so that T when restricted to W is a composition of these R reflections and R is at most N minus one by induction. Okay, so 
So I have I have reflections of W, but W is contained in V, okay, and inside W I have these R reflections. So I will try to construct reflections of V by extending these reflections to whole of V, okay. But to get reflections of whole of V, I need a n minus one dimensional uh, subspace on which the action of T is that of identity. Okay, so this uh, just think of this uh, one reflection SI. This is a reflection of W. So this SI has a hyperplane. There is a hyperplane HI on which the action of SI is that of identity. This HI is uh, n minus two dimensional. Yeah, this HI is n minus two dimensional, but uh, inside V, I want a hyperplane of dimension n minus one. But this vector X, remember, this vector X is perpendicular to W. Yeah, that's how we constructed uh, uh, this space W. It is perpendicular to this. So X is perpendicular to all vectors in W. HI is a hyperplane inside W. So I can add this vector X to HI. Then I will get uh, T is acting as identity on X and T is also acting identity on H. I mean, SI is acting on identity on HI. So I take the sum of the uh, line which is spanned by X and the hyperplane HI inside W to produce my hyperplane for the linear transformation T. Yeah. So define, yeah, I lost, did I lose my screen broadcasting? Yeah, it looks like. Yeah, let me restart. Just a minute. I have to, just a minute, I have to reconnect. Share the screen. Uh, can you see the screen now? I have shared. Uh, I don't see the screen yet. A minute. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, by induction, I got these reflections in the hyperplane, and I'm trying to construct reflections of the whole space. So every reflection SI has a hyperplane HI, and to that hyperplane, I add this vector X to get a n minus one dimensional space. Okay. Yeah. So so HI is the hyperplane W fixed mm -hmm. by SI. And uh, there is a there is a vector xi in W which is perpendicular to the hyperplane. Yeah. So, is there any question? Yeah. No. Sir. Okay. So, so then you take this vector xi belonging to W, uh, which was perpendicular to hi. Okay. And then take uh, to this uh, hyperplane hi uh, and add this um, line which is spanned by x. So this becomes comes a n minus one dimensional subspace. So this is my hyperplane. This is fixed by Ti because, uh, because this, uh, this is how I'm constructing Ti. Ti x is x and Ti restricted to W is Si. 
So to construct a linear transformation, I need to show its action on, on, uh, on basis vectors. So the basis is coming from this W, which is N minus one dimensional, and this vector X, which was perpendicular to W. And so I have described this linear transformation Ti. So on W, it is, uh, it is this reflection uh, SI, and uh, X is being fixed, okay? So now take this VI, which is HI plus linear span of X, this is fixed by Ti and Ti uh, restricted to W is SI and therefore this Ti is a reflection because it is mapping Xi into minus Xi, yeah? So this Xi is also perpendicular to X because Xi is taken from W and uh, Xi is also perpendicular to Hi because Hi is the hyperplane for the SI reflection, okay? So, so this, this shows that uh, the vector space is a direct sum of Vi and uh, the line spanned by Xi. And uh, so I have constructed a reflection of the whole space, which is an extension of the reflection Si. And uh, you can check that uh, my linear transformation is really the, the composition of these, uh, uh, these reflections, which are at most, uh, these are at most, uh, one reflections. So when I have an eigenvector with eigenvalue one of my orthogonal transformation, this argument shows using induction hypothesis that uh, it is a product of at most n minus one reflections. The theorem says that uh, it is a product of at most n reflections, but in, under, in this case, when uh, there was a fixed vector x, which is non-zero vector, then we can see that t is a product of at most n minus one reflections. Okay. All right, now we go to the second case where there is no fixed vector. And this case does arise. If you take two by two uh, orthogonal matrix whose determinant is one, that is a rotation. And a rotation of the plane has no fixed vector. So we have to deal with this situation. So suppose Tx is not equal to x for any, any, any x in V, yeah? Then uh, what do we do? So in this case, uh, because Tx is not equal to x for any x, I can take u equal to Tx minus x, right? So, uh, so here is my vector x and here is my vector Tx. Now, these two vectors have equal length because T is orthogonal map. Length of Tx is same as length of x, okay? And x and Tx are different vectors, okay? They are different vectors of unit length. So uh, plot these two vectors and then uh, complete the parallelogram, yeah? So if you complete the parallelogram, it is actually a rhombus because this length is equal to this length. And in a rhombus, we know this property of diagonals. This, this diagonal is x plus tx, and this diagonal is, this diagonal is tx minus x, yeah? So in plane geometry, we know that x plus tx is perpendicular to tx minus x. But now we are dealing with the inner product space in dimension n, uh, and this, this argument, really needs a analytic argument. So here is the analytic argument. Yeah. So take the inner product of Tx plus X and Tx minus X. The rhombus told you that it is perpendicular, but I need to show that the inner product is zero. So you just uh, uh, use the bilinear property. So Tx, Tx, then uh, Tx, Tx, and Tx, X, and Xx. But this is the square of length of Tx, and this is the square of length of X, and they are equal because t is orthogonal and uh, by symmetry, these two vectors are equal. I mean, these two numbers are equal. So this is, this is zero. So this shows, this shows that Tx plus X is perpendicular to Tx minus X. So I named Tx minus X as U, yeah? So this was my Tx and this is X and Tx minus X is my vector U. Then, then uh, this Tx plus X is, is in the hyperplane, which is perpendicular to, perpendicular to U. So because Tx plus X is perpendicular to U, so Tx plus X is in the hyperplane, okay? Yeah, now <clears throat> let U be a reflection with respect to H. H, remember H, I took this vector U, U was this vector Tx minus X. This is a non-zero vector. And now I can consider a hyperplane which is perpendicular to U. So this, this, is, uh, this is a subspace of dimension n minus one. And on this subspace, I can cons uh, construct a reflection 
on, on the whole space, I can construct a reflection whose plane of reflection is this subspace H. Yeah. So U, U is a, a linear transformation which is acting on Rn. Okay. And, and uh, this uh, H is a hyperplane and H, con H is perpendicular to Tx minus X. X is perpendicular to this vector. Okay, so that's the that is our situation. Okay, yeah. Just a minute. Yeah. So so look at now. Uh, <clears throat> look at the action of u on t x plus x. So t x plus x, yeah, that was perpendicular to t x minus x. So this reflection fixes this vector t x plus x, and uh, u on t x minus x is x minus t x because that's how I I am constructing this reflection. This reflection is with respect to the hyperplane, which is perpendicular to u. So it is mapping t x minus x to its negative. And Tx plus x is in the hyperplane, so it is mapping to itself. Yeah, but u is a linear transformation. So u acting on Tx plus x is u Tx plus ux, and this is equal to Tx plus x because this is this is in the hyperplane. And u acting on Tx minus x is u Tx minus ux, but this is x minus Tx because Tx minus x is perpendicular to the hyperplane, and u is a reflection. So now you look at these two equations. And add these two equations. If you add these two equations, then uh, then uh, 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 if you add these two equations, then uh, these two cancels, and uh, then t x cancels, and you get u t x equal to x. Yeah. So so uh, by by composing t, which is the original orthogonal transformation, by this reflection u, yeah. I have found a eigenvector with eigenvalue one, but u is orthogonal. U is a reflection, so it's an orthogonal transformation, and t is an orthogonal transformation. So this composition is orthogonal transformation, and it has a eigenvector with eigenvalue one. So we are back to case one. Yeah, u t x is x. So by case one, u t is a composition of at most. U t is a composition of at most n minus one reflections. Yeah, so. So, uh, so write ut as a composition of at most n minus one reflections of v, and now we multiply by u. U is uh, u square is identity, so you can compose with u on both the sides and get t equal to u times t one t two t s, and that's a product of at most r reflections. Yeah, so that is the proof of uh, uh, this uh, beautiful theorem of Cartan and uh, Diodone. Are there any doubts? Any doubts about uh, the proof? Yeah, this is standard proof as we do in basic linear algebra courses. We translate a property of matrices into a property of linear transformations and then apply induction on the dimension. Yeah, this is what we did here. The only uh, non-trivial idea in the proof is that the possibility of a eigenvector with eigenvalue one, but that is from our experience that sometime it happens that there is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one and that simplified our uh, proof. And then we have to deal with the other case. Yeah. Okay, so now let me derive uh, a classical theorem of uh, Euler. Uh, so Euler uh, worked in many areas. And of course, he, is, uh, he worked in uh, classical mechanics, uh, where he had to understand what is the meaning of a rotation and uh, how do we uh, deal with rotations analytically. So <clears throat> first we need to define what we mean by rotation. A rotation of R3 is a linear operator from R3 to R3 uh, so that rho fixes a unit vector which is called the pole of rho and uh, the perpendicular space to W is, uh, is, is a rotation of the plane. So we understand rotations in plane. Yeah. So if this is the plane, then every vector in the plane is being rotated by angle theta. 
that is the action of the uh, this uh, rotation in the plane and there is an axis of rotation yeah there is an axis of rotation so vectors along the axis get fixed and the plane which is perpendicular to this axis of rotation they are being all rotated by a fixed angle theta okay so that that is our understanding of uh, what is the rotation of the three dimensional space okay so i'm uh, assuming that uh, you know and uh, you know the uh, the analytic meaning of rotation of a plane so rotations of plane they are given by 2 by 2 orthogonal matrices which can be written as cos theta sin theta then minus sin theta cos theta yeah these are the matrices of rotations of the plane and then uh, three dimensional rotation is having an axis uh, on which all the vectors are fixed and then the the plane which is perpendicular to that axis uh, uh, the vectors in that plane are being rotated by a fixed angle theta okay yeah so a 3 by 3 matrix a which induces a rotation of the plane is called a rotation matrix yeah so uh, the, the 3 by 3 matrices induce linear transformations and if uh, that linear transformation is uh, is a rotation as per our definition then this matrix called rotation matrix and uh, euler's theorem identified exactly what are the rotation matrices okay so uh, so uh, suppose uh, e1 is a pole of the rotation rho in the xy plane right in the three dimensional space suppose uh, i take this uh, vector e1 and this is the pole and the the uh, yz plane is the uh, plane of rotation so here I am rotating vectors by angle theta. So, so E2, E2 is mapped to another vector and uh, E3 is mapped to another vector. And these are obtained by rotating by angle theta. So, uh, so if I write the matrix of this rotation of the, uh, uh, this is YZ plane, YZ plane, then uh, with respect to E1, E2, E3, this is the matrix, yeah. In the YZ plane, uh, this is the matrix of rotation and the x axis is being fixed yeah so that is the matrix and you can check that this is in so3 this matrix is in so3 because determinant is one and uh, it is an orthogonal matrix okay so we want to show that every rotation matrix looks like this that is a simple change of basis argument and this is the euler's theorem that the group of all rotation matrices of R3 is really SU3. Yeah. So, so when I to show that the rotation matrices have are orthogonal matrices of determinant one, and then when I to show the converse that any matrix in SO3 induces the rotation of R3. But a consequence of this result is that if you compose two rotations, it is a rotation. This is uh, geometrically not so clear, right? Because if I have a rotation, then there is a plane of rotation and then there is an angle. I could have another rotation with another plane. Yeah, and there is another angle of rotation here. So if I compose these, it says that the composition of these two rotations is a rotation. So we need to determine what is the axis of rotation and what is the plane of rotation enough to determine axis of rotation. To determine axis of rotation, I need to find an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. So it says that if I multiply two matrices in SO3, the product matrix will have, I mean, uh, one, one can find an axis, okay? So that is, uh, that is to show that there is an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. We will show that, that any matrix in SO3 has an eigenvector with eigenvalue one. And uh, that that uh, gives us the axis of rotation, yeah. But uh, this is the corollary, which is not clear if you geometrically define rotation. That composition of two rotations is a rotation, yeah. So first, uh, let A be uh, a matrix in SO three, yeah. Then one is an eigenvalue. So uh, the proof is rather easy. So I need to show that uh, determinant of i minus A is zero. But look at determinant of y minus a, that is determinant of y minus a transpose. This is, so I can multiply by determinant of a because a has determinant one. 
and so determinant of a times determinant, determinant of i minus a transpose and now you can uh, use the product formula that says it is determinant of a minus a transpose but that is minus of determinant of my m i minus a but i minus a is a three by three matrix so uh, so that that shows that uh, determinant of i minus a is zero yeah so so th this shows that any matrix in so3 uh, has one as an eigenvalue and there is a eigenvector. Another proof is use the cartan dudonet theorem. So take a non-identity matrix, which is three by three matrix in SO3. Then the cartan dudonet theorem says that, uh, that it must be a product of at most three reflections, but, uh, but uh, the determinant is one. So one cannot have three reflections when one, one can have two reflections, which are distinct. Yeah. So T factors as product of two reflections and their planes are <clears throat> having some angle between them, non-trivial angle. So uh, now look at these two planes. The sum of these two planes, uh, it spans the whole space because H1 and H2 are not um, identical planes. So the dimension of the sum of these two subspaces is three, but that is dimension H1 plus dimension H2 minus dimension of H1 intersection H2. And this is, this is four minus this dimension. So the intersection has dimension one. Yeah. So two planes which are not parallel to each other in three dimensional space, the intersection is a line. And this is what it says. Uh, so since the vectors in H1 and H2 are fixed by these two reflections, any vector in the intersection is fixed, fixed by these reflections fixed by this, uh, uh, this this t, okay? Because I factor t by using cartan dudonet theorem, I factor t as composition of two reflections. Each one has a plane of reflections and the, inter the line of intersection of these two planes is uh, fixed by both these reflections. So t fixes any vector on the line of reflection and that gives me a eigenvector with eigenvalue one, yeah? Okay, so now let me prove the uh, Euler's theorem. So suppose M is a matrix of rotation whose pole is U and angle is theta. Okay, so pole is given to me and uh, angle is given. So vectors inside the plane, they are being rotated by angle theta. Okay, and uh, so now you choose uh, an orthonormal basis of W. So to take two vectors, which are, which are um, perpendicular, uh, take an orthonormal basis of W and uh, U can be chosen to be a unit vector which is perpendicular to U. And so if I take a basis V and W of V of W and then along with that, if I add U, I have an orthonormal basis of R3. And uh, my matrix gives rise to a linear transformation from R3 to R3 and so, which is Tmx equal to Mx for all X but uh, I can find the matrix of TM with respect to this basis UVW, with respect to UVW. But when TM is acting on these basis vectors, U is fixed and V and W are being rotated by angle theta. So this is the matrix of uh, this linear transformation TM. Yeah, This is the matrix of linear transformation TM with respect to this basis. Okay, So I have this linear transformation uh, and uh, I have its uh, matrix with respect to this new basis. And so I can relate this matrix with the matrix of TM with respect to the old basis and they are similar matrices. So this uh, formula we learned in basic linear algebra that the matrix of TM with respect to standard basis is similar to the matrix of TM in this new basis B and uh, the, uh, the matrix this P, this, uh, this basis is orthonormal basis so uh, when I construct this matrix, it is an orthogonal matrix. Uh, it's an orthogonal matrix. And uh, this is the connection between M prime and uh, M. So M is P M prime P transpose, but the P is an orthogonal matrix because the column vectors are orthonormal basis of R3 and M prime is orthogonal matrix. It's a matrix in SO3, okay? Its determinant is one, it's an orthogonal matrix. So therefore, uh, so, uh, so therefore, uh, M is in SO3. This matrix M is in SO3 by this because of this change of basis formula. Yeah. So conversely, suppose I take a matrix in SO3, uh, then uh, uh, take the uh, <clears throat> linear transformation, which is induced by M, 
then we know that this matrix has a unit eigenvector with eigenvalue 1 and take the perpendicular plane to this eigenvector and the map from W to W is the orthogonal map because uh, I mean T is orthogonal map because T is induced by an orthogonal matrix and orthogonal map is going to map vectors which are perpendicular to, to you to perpendicular to vectors to you. So T restricts to this uh, plane of dimension 2 in R3 and it's an orthogonal map. So uh, orthogonal maps of plane are, we, you know, they are either rotations or reflections. But when I restrict this, um, uh, this linear transformation to W, uh, then the, um, this restriction cannot be a reflection because it will then violate the fact that the determinant of M is, is 1. So I mean, determinant of M is 1. So when I restrict it to W, it must give rise to rotation. Because if it gives rise to a reflection, then T will have an eigenvalue minus 1. Okay. And um, uh, I mean, so, uh, no, no, sorry. T, T from W to W is a rotation. So it will, it will have two eigenvalues which are complex. Okay. And uh, so that will violate this condition, determinant of M is 1. Okay. So that's the proof of Euler's theorem. And uh, I think that is also end of my talk. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Verma. Uh, let's thank the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the very nice talk. Thank you. So are there any questions or comments from the students or anybody else? Okay, uh, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, just maybe out of context. So yeah. Not. Yeah. So, this uh, Cartan's theorem of this yeah. decomposition of the orthogonal transformation. Yes. On the other hand, uh, we have this form spaces, right? We have uh, weak decomposition. Right. Of... So, so that was the approach of the Lune, uh, that yes. Lune wanted to generalize this to arbitrary fields. Yes. And, uh, one then one has to uh, get into this uh, width cancellation theorem and uh, width extension theorems. And yeah, so the whole thing can be uh, written in terms of quadratic forms and yes. bilinear forms and uh, where <clears throat> is uh, orthogonality and uh, these householder matrices, they have analogous formulas. So <clears throat> there's a very similar proof, very mm -hmm. accessible proof in Jacobson volume one, <coughs> basic algebra by Jacobson. <clears throat> so there is a chapter called uh, metric vector spaces where he develops this uh, Witt's theory and uh, derives Cartan Dudunu theorem for arbitrary fields. I see. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <clears throat>